and welcome back. Um, after I did my Bellamine chat a few weeks ago, it was really popular, which surprised me. So I'm back again, and I have chosen um, another of my very, very favourite finds from the foreshore that I, always makes me incredibly excited when I find them, uh, which is silly really, because they're really, really common. Um, so I always say it's the three pins, that, the, the three Ps that are really common. It's pottery, uh, pipes and pins, and it's pins that we're going to be doing today. Um, so we're going to start off, actually, before I take you on a, a little tour through my, uh, my drawers, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to start off with the earliest pins that I've got. Now, these pins aren't what we're actually going to be talking about later, but they are very, very old. They're 2,000 years old, and I, I'm actually going to pick you up and uh, show you them, so hold on a second. And I should say that if you have any uh, questions, just, just write them on the bottom. I have a lovely assistant behind me who is carefully watching all of your questions and writing them on the board for me, so I will try and get to them. So well, first of all, we're gonna start with my earliest, earliest pins. Um, hold on a minute, I'm gonna turn you around. Oh God, where's the turning round button? Um, um, there it is, right, it's up in the top corner. Excuse me, this is all new technology for me. So, right, I'm just going to turn you around, trying not to show you my kitchen. Hold on a second. All right, here we go, here we go. Right, these are the earliest pins I have. And they do qualify as pins because they are hairpins. These are Roman hairpins, if you can see. Every single one is broken. Some of them have got these, these lovely bobbles on top. Each one has been individually turned on a lathe. See that one's got a couple of nice little um, lines on top. This one's quite plain. Um, each one has been turned individually on a lathe. I've found lots of little bits as well. Um, and they would have been hairpins. They would have held up Roman ladies' hair. And they had quite elaborate hairdos in those days. Um, and it, I just find it incredible that I can still find these. And I find them in one particular spot, which makes me wonder whether these are um, maybe manufacturing waste from the people who made them. Or perhaps it's the site of a drain that fed into the river in, in Roman times. And these were the, the pins that broke while maybe ladies were putting them back in their hair in the bathhouses. Who knows? Who knows? But they are... 2,000 years old, and these are the oldest pins I have. But the pins that I am going to be talking to you about today... Oh, someone's asking how long they would have been. Probably about woo, that long. About that long altogether. So the pins we're going to be talking about today are metal pins. And they are the sort of pins that would have held people's clothes together. Now, uh, this is my one of my drawers. This is my drawer of... Um, uh, dress accessories. So we start up here, I've got some buttons here and I'll, I'll just wave you over very, very slowly so you can get a, a little bit of a look, but not too much of a look because I might be coming back to these at a later date and I don't want to spoil the surprises. So here are some of my buttons. I've got a few drawers of de dress accessories. So this is just happens to be where my pins are. Here are my, my thimbles here. Uh, more than one for each finger at the moment. Um, hooks and eyes, lots of hooks and eyes. Buckles, loads and loads of buckles, dating right back, these buckles, to uh, medieval times. And um, then coming down here, it, uh, it randomly goes into an ox shoe. I don't know why I, I put that in there, but there we go. Um, and there are a few uh, mounts that would have decorated leather objects here. And the, and the very curious round wire loops that they found on the Mary Rose, actually, and, and people now think that these were something to do with doing up um, dresses and, and shirts and things like that sewn into the clothes. People have been saying that they were for bundling up pins, but I really don't think they are, and most people um, kind of agree with that. Uh, then we go into the aglets. These are the hard bits that are, they, they, you still use them on the end of your laces. And um, in the olden days when they used to lace bodices and, and cod pieces and, and jerkins and things together, they'd put these copper alloy, they are, little tiny tubes of metal. And some of them have got tiny holes with rivets in. But we're not looking at those today. We are looking at the pins. Feast your eye on those pins. I don't have very many at the moment. I give these away. So I've been giving lots away recently. And... Um, this is my, my stock of pins that I've got at the moment. So pins like this are incredibly common on the foreshore. 
They are the tiniest, tiniest pieces of... I'm going to turn you around again. This looks straight up my nose. Um, tiniest, tiniest pieces of, of human history that each one is just a, li a little tiny story. And these gather together in, in nests. Sometimes you, you, you go down to pick something up out of the mud and you'll, you'll prick your fingers on them. There's so many of them. The, the river washes them together, like the other things that the river washes together. It washes them together in weight and size. And because these little pins are all similar weight and size, they tend to wash together in, in busy areas, maybe around the stairs, where people came down the stairs to get into the boats and the wherries to, to travel up and down the river when the river was an important highway. Um, so they date from between around 1400 and the beginning of the 1800s, when the process of pin making was mechanised. Um, and each one of these pins is handmade. It's a work of art. Um, it it was, was often a family affair. Um, families would work in quite dingy, um, dark conditions, destroying their eyes while they did it. Um, and the way they would make these tiny, tiny pins um, is that they would take wire of a certain gauge, they'd pull it to length, they'd cut it into pieces, and then they'd take another piece of wire and they'd wrap it three times around the top to make the head of the pin. Um, this is probably, oh, let me see if I can find a bigger one for you that you can see, but here's, here's a larger one and you, you, might, you might just be able to see the way that the wire has been wrapped around the top to make the pin. This was sometimes dipped into solder, sometimes I've got ones that weren't. Um, and then with each one, they would sharpen each one by hand, they'd polish it and they'd finish it off and that's how they made the pin. Now what they used to sharpen it on was called a pinner's bone and I'm lucky enough to have found a pinner's bone, although I didn't realise this was a pinner's bone when I first found it. I thought it was just a, a, a bit of a funny shaped bone with some, some sort of cuts on the end. So I brought it home and it spent a few years in the garden before I realised what it was. It's a pinner's bone, so what they do is they'd, they'd take a pin, they'd lay it in one of these grooves here to hold it still and then they'd run a file over the end and that's how they'd sharpen it and, um, and polish it up. So this is a pinner's bone and you do find these pinner's bones also on the foreshore. They're, they're, they're not easy to find but you do find them. So the reason there are so many pins and people ask, always ask me this, why are there so many pins on the foreshore? The reason, there is a reason, is because everybody used them. Everybody did up their clothes with pins. Pins were used from day one. They used to pin babies into swaddling and then people would use them throughout their lives to pin themselves into their clothes. Those, those incredible ruffs that you, you see the Tudors wearing would take sometimes thousands, hundreds of pins to pin together um, laboriously. The, um, the, then people, obviously they didn't have zippers, they didn't have poppers or Velcro or anything like that. Buttons were expensive so pins were the cheaper alternative. Um, they'd, they'd pin, uh, at the end of their lives, they'd be pinned into their shrouds. They used pins to make their clothes, everyone made their clothes. Um, and they'd use pins in lace making as well. So pins were really, really, really important. The pinning industry in London was enormous, absolutely huge. And even so, they couldn't keep up with demand. So they were importing pins as well from France. France was another important pinning place and they'd import them in barrels. So everybody was using pins and from the number I find on the foreshore everyone was also losing pins but they weren't cheap. Um, the word pin money, you might have heard of the word pin money. It, uh, these days uh, pin money is something that is a trifling amount, it's a small amount but in those days the pin money was the amount of money that was given to a woman by her husband or her father to buy the pins she needed to pin herself into her dresses. Um, and, and pins were valuable, like, like anything. Our ancestors, they didn't live in a throwaway society. They looked after what they, they had. It all cost money. Money had to be worked hard for, and everything was handmade. So they would have their pins resharpened and keep using them. Um, the pins that I find, I think probably, fell off people, you know, as they were working, as they were walking around. Sometimes maybe they bent so badly they couldn't re-straighten them and they threw them away. Um, a lot of rubbish got dumped into the river. Perhaps the pins were in the rubbish, swept up from the streets, dropped in the middens, dropped into the toilets that were, that were dumped into the river. And that's how they ended up into the river, washed down drains. 
but there are huge numbers of pins on the foreshore if you know where and how to look for them. Some of them are tiny, tiny pins, like, look at this one. Oh, I don't even know if you can see this one, but this, this one, it's as fine as a baby's hair. And it's, there's something so therapeutic looking for these. Uh, you know, I can spend hours and hours just picking them out of the mud. Um, and the knowledge that when you're picking something up like this up, it, it, you're, you're touching it. You're the first person to touch it since maybe somebody one morning tried to push it into a piece of cloth that was too thick, bent it, cursed, dropped it, threw it away, ended up in the river, and I'm the first person to reach back through history and touch it. It's a magical moment. Um, so the pens I have moving forwards to medieval times, I have, this is a very obvious medieval pin. It's really hard to date pins. They really didn't change that much. Um, unless you find them in context, it's, it's quite difficult to put a date on just the, the ordinary pins that you find, just these ones. They're, they're quite hard to date out of context. But the ones with the larger heads, the ones that are a little bit more uh, decorated, are easier to, to date. This is a, a medieval pin. You might be able to see a collar underneath. It's got that little collar. And that's how you tell it's older. So it's got a much larger, it's got a large head and a nice collar around the uh, bottom of it. Um, moving through to the post-medieval period, um, I have quite a number of nicely decorated pins with big, big heads on them. So here we go. If you can see those, Ooh, I'll put it in front of my face and the camera might focus on that instead of me, or put it there. There we go. They've got some nice, nicely decorated, nice big heads on them. And uh, maybe these would have been used for thicker, more woolen type cloth. Um, these are real whoppers, these ones. These are post-medieval, these are probably um, 16th or 17th century, but look at the size of the head on those, aren't they great? You can imagine someone pushing those into a cloak, closing up something, something nice heavy woolen cloak, keeping it closed, you can imagine it dropping out and falling into the mud and staying there for 500 years. Some of them, as I say, I think people um, took their... Uh, I think some people um, took a pin and they might have bent it. Maybe they bent it and used it as a hook. Now I've heard from reenactors who say that they've, they've done that to their pins before and used it as a, just a useful hook to, to hook their cloaks together instead or, or doing something like that. Um, this one I think really obviously has been, has been bent. Perhaps that was a fishing hook. Maybe somebody used a pin. It would make sense, wouldn't it, to, uh, to turn a pin into a fishing hook. That would have worked really well, actually. It's got a little head on the end that you could have tied your, your string onto it. Um, we will never know. Then, of course, you get the very long, thin ones, like these. As you can see, these are very thin and quite long. And I think these may have secured the veils that people wore uh, in medieval times. You know, the, the veils, the wimples that ladies wore, and the various sort of scarves and, and headgear that women wore. Um, these are much longer. I've got fatter, longer ones. I don't know if these were used to, for, for headgear, but certainly these thinner ones, I think, probably were. Um, now, going back to the cost of pins, people sometimes say, well, how much were they worth? Um, I do have some statistics here, excuse me. Um, it's, it's, they're a bit high class, but it gives you an idea of how much these pins actually cost. So, in um, 1565, Elizabeth I had her own pinner, and his name was Robert Careless. And Robert Careless, in 1665, provided the Queen with this. He provided her with 16,000 great farthingale pins at six shillings per thousand. He provided 20,000 middle farthingale pins at four shillings per thousand. 20,000 great velvet pins at two shillings eight pence per thousand and 58 small velvet and head pins at 20 pence per thousand. Now that was just six months worth of pins for Elizabeth's court. So you can imagine how many they were using and how many pins it took just to pin her into her dress. Um, so that's a really brief kind of um, explanation of pins. My pins I keep in this here 
It's a, it's a dome, glass dome, and inside, some people have said this looks like the coronavirus. I think that's a bit unfair. Um, it, it's, uh, it, I suppose it does, I think it looks a bit like a sea urchin, but um, I've made a, a little pin cushion and just stuck them in a, in a glass dome, but they look quite, they look nice like that. Um, and each time I go out, I'll bring back some more, um, just to add to my collection. Um, these are the larger pins that I've got. Here, all sorts of sizes and shapes and big ones. Um, I've got a couple that haven't even got heads on them. There's this one, which is rather nice. See, it's got a squiggle rather than a head on top. If I put it on my forehead, you can see it much easier, can't you? There you go. And then this one, which I'm not even sure if it is a pin. I like to think it is a pin and there was someone out there with a little bit of um, you know, creative talent. Um, it's certainly been sharpened. It's certainly sharp on the end. It's made of copper alloy. Like I should say that all of these pins are made of copper alloy. That's why they don't rust away. Modern pins today are made of steel, so they're just gonna rust away. Like most of our rubbish, uh, we're not really leaving much worth behind, but these things are made of copper alloy, so they've been preserved perfectly in the Thames mud, and the Thames mud is anaerobic. There's no oxygen in there to uh, to rust or rot them away, which is why they survive so well. But this one is made of copper alloy again, and you can see it's just a sort of random squiggle on top, but it's definitely, definitely been sharpened on the end. So I'm not sure ooh, if that's a pin. Or, or what it is, uh, I like to think it's a pin, it's just something a little bit, someone got a little bit creative with their pin making, maybe, who knows. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, let me have a look, are there any, are the pins still sharp? They are still sharp, you can still use them. Um, I have used them before to pin things together and to do the sort of things you do with, um, you do with pins. It's not an old sack tie, it's definitely not an old sack tie. Um, sorry, someone was asking if it's an old sack tie, but I, I really don't think it is. Um, yes, they are still sharp. Uh, I've given some to reenactors and they've used them. They enjoy using them. It's really nice to give them uh, another life. Uh, you know, they've traveled all that way through history. They've survived. It's nice that they can go back into service again um, and do what they were made, made for. Um, how do I spot them in the mud? It's, it's one of those things you get your eye in, like everything else with mudlarking. Once you see them, you, you can't not see them. They're everywhere. Um, you just really need someone to point them out to you. I've I pointed them out to some people and left them, left them there, gone back in a couple of hours and they're still there pulling them out of the mud. Um, it's a case of uh, just learning to spot them. Once you've seen them once, um, they really are um, uh, quite easy to spot. The glass domes that I use, I just got them off eBay. They weren't very expensive and um, they work really well actually for putting all sorts of things. They've got a nice pine bottom and um, a glass top and you can put whatever you want inside them. Dating the pins, I've sort of been through. The, the early medieval ones have the, that nice collar on the bottom um, and apart from that, they are hard to date unless they've got a nice big head on top and they're decorated in some way. Just the very ordinary ones are really hard to date unless you find them in context because they, they haven't really changed, they didn't change that much between around 1400 and, and sort of the early 1800s. They stayed pretty much the same. Um, so, uh, so that's me. Before I go, I don't want to leave out needles. Everyone asks me, do I find needles? And yeah, yeah I do find needles, but not very many of them. Um, so it is like, instead of a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in the mud. Um, I do find, uh, uh, I have found a few needles, but I think obviously they made less needles and they were probably used and used and used um, until there really wasn't much left of them. And um, these are my needles. This is about all I've found on the foreshore in terms of needles. Uh, uh, some of them, you can tell that they're handmade from the little tiny um, holes in them. Uh, some of them are so, have been worn so short um, that, that that's probably why they ended up in the river. This one, look how, look how, ah, look how short that one is and how worn that is. It's just tiny. Um, so some of them, the thicker ones may have been um, for sail making, um, the smaller ones for dressmaking. And I do have part 
of a bone needle. They did make them out of bone in the uh, Roman times and in um, the medieval times. You could just see from the end, that's a broken bone needle, uh, which would have been about, well, that would have been the top and that, that would have been the end. So um, that's about all I've got to say about pins. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, Give it a like. I'm going to be putting this on YouTube eventually. I have a YouTube channel. It is Mudlarking with Lara Maitland. So um, uh, it will eventually go up there. Um, and I will be back. Uh, let me know if there's anything you particularly want me to talk about. And I will, um, I will drag it out of my cabinet of river curiosities. Someone's just asked me about hypodermic syringe needles um, and uh, do I worry about them? You don't find that many of them. You do see them sometimes. Um, I always wear gloves, not that that would really help, but um, uh, I don't really worry about it. You don't find them that often, to be honest. Um, just steer clear of them. But uh, that's it for today. I hope you're all keeping well um, and uh, I will be actually I will be back next week with an interview with Turi King, Professor Turi King, who is famous for genetically identifying Richard III. Um, and we are going to be talking about the skull I found on the estuary. So if you've been following that story, um, that should be really interesting. So that's my next, it's not live, but that's my next video coming up soon. So tune in then, stay safe everybody, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.